Hello, everyone. My name is Salim Ali, and it's a good segue from Jeff's talk. I'm going to talk about, in a sense, one theme is, what will you build? That's one takeaway that I didn't plan for. That'll come out through the discussion anyway. So what I'm going to talk about today is communities. I'll talk about what does it mean? What does it matter? Let's talk about it from a real world perspective. We'll go back to online and come back to the real world as well. Along the way, I'll try to weave in why I built LOYAC. That wasn't the primary driver, but I'll try to build the story anyway. I probably have about 25, 30 minutes, and we'll probably do a Q&A after that. Harker is special to me as well. My daughter starts middle school in fall. That's also the broad sense there. What are communities? Why do they matter? All of us work in teams today. We do. Study groups, class projects, bunch of things. We do, right? Small set of people coming together around a very simple task, a complex task. Now, what is the nuance of that project team, right? One is typically small, four to five people, not big. You govern or you anchor around a common project or task. Very simple. A lot of value, right? Building a project, you're building a product, whatever. They're typically short bound from a time duration perspective. Teams come together, team dissipate. Now take that notion to community, slightly broader in context and scope. Communities anchor around shared ideas. So you have a broader purpose in life. Much longer in duration. Communities don't go away that easily. They live, they breathe. And it's typically a much larger set of people coming together. That's the subtle difference between teams and communities. Now the question is, why does it matter? Why should we care about teams and communities? Why should you care, given where you are in life right now? You are high school, pretty much on the cusp of leaving your nest. And that's real world, right? You're in, an, in a domain where you know your friends, you know your family, you have a neighborhood, all of that. So there's a certain level of comfort there, a certain level of known entities that's going to change for a fact. More likely go to a college, not in the Bay Area, a new town, a bunch of people around you whom you don't really know, who are not your friends. So understanding how to engage in communities is very, very important. You're probably trying to enter new communities. What's the decorum? What works, what doesn't work? It's going to come into play. So that's a broader context of community, right? And communities also are going to impact your personal life, how you get connected to new people, the things you do, all of that. It also has a tremendous impact on a professional setting as well, how you're going to live your business life. So both dimensions are very important. And if you understand, if we understand communities, how to engage, it'll help us be successful in our personal life and on the, on the business life as well. So let me spend a minute on the business life and the impact of community. Before Facebook and the other such giants came into play, communities have been around for eons. Right? It's not a new concept. Facebook made it done better, much easier. But we as human beings have been social right from day zero, if you will. So we know that. But what's happened is, really think about it, the whole business value chain has really reverberated and shifted, trying to grasp the nuance of communities. How you build a product has changed from 10 years back. How you market a product has changed dramatically compared to 10 years back. How you sell has dramatically changed as well. So unless you understand that social dimension has changed the value chain completely, we are not ready for the next gen business. We just are not. Let me give you two examples, right? Before when you build a product, 
you have an idea, you talk to you know, five <coughs> prospects, 10 customers, you go into a room, you build. Today you can talk to a gazillion people before you write, write a line of code, or when you're writing a line of code. It's just that's what's happening. The volume of information coming to you is much more, and it's your choice how much to accept. So the building process is much more democratized. It's huge, it's different. Marketing is dramatically different as well. What do we do before? Buy an email list, send a bunch of emails to your enterprise customers, they respond yourself. There's no dialogue really. But now you get a lot of information from the social networks of the world today. LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, this amount of data coming in is much more frequent, much more in volume. So how do you take that? Have a meaningful dialogue with customers. That is also changing. Selling is changing as well. The point is pretty simple. Community and social has changed the landscape. And what does social really mean? What sits at the kernel of social is community. Social is a layer on community, if you think about it. Communities exist, and we put layers on top that we can meaningfully engage in, a, in an easy fashion, in a sustainable fashion, in a frictionless fashion. So understanding community, therefore, is very important. And understanding it from beyond one level at the cursory level. Go one level deeper. That's what I'll try to talk about a little bit today. Now, why do we engage in communities? We are all social beings, right? Let's understand a little bit more. Actually, it's pretty simple. Some of us, all of us, have a desire to belong. We want to be part of a group. We want to be part of a, some community that exists, or you want to form one. Because that's our innate need as a human being. That, that's how it is. Absolutely rely, absolutely makes sense, absolutely a, a viable concept. There's another nuance, very important, the altruistic norm. We want to do good. That's a nature. Right? So that aspect is also very important. A third dimension is also very relevant. Some of us want rewards. Could be a mayor of a four square town. Could be a badge, a strike. Could be a, a you want to be a mentor in a community. You want to get some tangible rewards. So that's also a model how people react and behave. One, you want to belong, you're altruistic. Third, you want something tangible. All of these models can coexist, do coexist, we know that. So that's the lens to understand how communities in general engage. We will keep that in mind as we go along. Now let's look at communities holistically, the kind of communities that exist. This is, this, these are supposed to be overlapping Venn diagrams, so meaning they're not mutually exclusive, right? So different ways of looking at the, the communities. Let's look at the anchor pillar or pivot. Communities anchor around affinities. Your gun high, students, alumni, or Stanford, or Kellogg, whatever, pick anything, right? That's an affinity. You're probably of a ethnic origin. That's an affinity right there. There are many other such dimensions for affinity, and you could pick any dimension. Or it could be interest-based. You like soccer, you like golf, you like movies. Fair enough. So that association also comes into play as you anchor and as you pivot around the community you engage with. There's another dimension, which is your personal arena versus your professional domain. A lot of communities today, like Facebook to a great extent, uh, Instagram to a great extent, are very personal in nature. There's LinkedIn on the other hand, right? Or Cloud on the other hand, is much more professional from a scoping perspective. And these domains sometimes match, sometimes don't quite overlap that cleanly. Because why? Because we keep our personal life we want to, distinct from a professional life. So that line is blurring for sure, but that's how it works, that's how we think. A third dimension is the time-bound aspect of communities. A lot of them are persistent. <coughs> Stays with us. Friends, 
stay with that. Of course, friends may change, but it stays with us for a long time. Your interests probably will stay on a long time, long horizon as well. Some are temporal. They're fleeting. They're contextual. I'll come back to that point a little later, but keep that point in your mind as well. The notion of temporal networks. So that's something as we need to look at the community, just keep these frames in mind. But ultimately though, right, we get value from communities. That's why we engage, right? Either it's an emotional value, makes us happy, we're doing good, we're meeting new people, or it's functional. Something tangible, you're getting, you're coding done faster. Is we have to sell better. You're making new connections, something really, really tangible. That's the second dimension of value. Now, let's step into the online world now. Right? What I've said, talked about so far applies to both online and offline. Now let's step back into step into the online world. And let's try to play a social anthropologist, right? A detective. And understand guys, how do we work in real life? And what happens in the online world? Because keep in mind, social cannot lead real life. Typically social follows, broadly speaking. You take a real life experience, optimize it, make it better, more fun, faster, <coughs> then there's value to be created as an entrepreneur. So if you look at the real world, right, and the online world, there is a bunch of co contexts that come into play. Friends, followers, your location, your mobile, persistent. There are a bunch of brands that provide very, very valuable services like Facebook, and Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, a bunch of stuff, right? So that's the real life we live in. But if you try to draw a pattern, try to look at it from a gap perspective, a few things do come and jump out though. One, we focus a lot on known and persistent connections. That's what we do. Friends, follower, connections, that's what we do. Most of interactions, right, in the online world today is are around known connections. Nothing wrong with that, absolutely essential, core to our life, but that's what we do. But if you map it to your daily life in the real world though, let's see what happens. You wake up at home, let's say in Los Altos, you may engage your neighbor or someone else around you, you don't really know them, right? You talk to them, you have a need to talk to them. Hey, why did the siren go off? Did the light, why are cops the next door? Do that. You come to school or college, you may run into many people who are not really your friends, but you talk to them. Why? There's a context that matters. At Stanford, at Gunn, at, in, 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 uh, in Harvard. Let's say you go to an internship on campus. Talk to many people. All of you are not your friends, right? You don't want to be friends with everyone you meet. Or you go to a game or concert. You talk to the fan next to you. You don't know them. You don't ask for their ID before you talk to them. <coughs> Nor do you say, show me your profile. I'm a guy, I like soccer. Then let's talk. We don't do that either. But our online thinking has been guided, modulated by that kind of methodology. Why? Because we rightfully so focused on the most core, which is our friends. So if you step beyond this, right, and say, what if people, a lot of us have the notion of shared experience. As we go through our day, we are shared experiences. So how can we engage people around a shared experience? This is a shared experience right now. Because we have something in common. Time bound and interest bound. So keep that point in mind. And most of these cases, prior friendship may not be a requirement. It's okay if you have that. Let's say you go to a conference or a game. If your friends are going there, you know that anyway. 10,000 people. The 10 guys, you know, they know. But you land there, the other 9, 990, you don't know. But would you want to engage with them, right? That's a question. This is a quote from 150 years back. Lord Palmston was a lord in the British Council. He said, in a different context though, 
we don't have eternal friends, but our interests are much broader, much longer, and it's diverse and changing. So this point here is interesting because, interesting, no pun intended, because interests and time or location have to come together somehow to create more value. So if you look at daily life, how can you make that happen better? So let's understand shared experience a little bit better, the way we look at it, right? I look at it. A shared experience has three basic pivots. Basic is location. You're here. Not your lap long. That's one part of location. But the context around that was what makes it meaningful. I'm at Stanford. I'm in Palo Alto. I'm in Gun High. I'm in Harker High. So location plus context. I'll look at zone around your location. Is, it matters. And then there's interest. So if you bring that together, it becomes a shared experience which is more temporal, perhaps, which is very much location-centric. Now, this temporal and nomadic networks, right, shared experience networks could be at home, could be work, could be fun, all of the above. And you go, as you, if you look at it, you go in and out through a day. It happens today. You may not even realize it, but it does happen. So that said, I'm going to now segue very shortly into what I'm trying to do at LOAP because the theme, as I was told, is entrepreneurship. So, so I mean, when I was running social at SAP, I built a community network there and other, other places. So let's understand how can we look at the real life problems that we have today and maybe solve it slightly differently. So we say, let's try to understand, can we share this, or can we extend this experience of, around a shared experience, make it a little bit better, a little bit more meaningful. Mobile first. Because today we know the desktop is fine, but we are on the phone all the time, we engage all the time, right? So the name of the company is Loyak, L-O-Y-A-K-K. -K. Local yakking. <laughs> it's very simple, that's what it is, right? It's not complex. And a way to think about it is instant communities on demand. Communities are, should be plug in, plug in out. Why do you want to be friends with me and followers with me? No. I go to a place, I plug into a community, I talk to them, I, I disconnect, I go and connect somewhere else. Simple. Let's say you're traveling to, you want to go to Barcelona, right? You ask your friends, hey, what's a good restaurant for Barcelona? Hey, where should I go backpacking, whatever. Don't go to Barcelona, ask, some, ask a local there. Why can't you do that? So connect to the Barcelona community, ask a question. Simple, that's a simple premise. So think of locations of venues, you are at a university, right, in your, in your day, or a gun, or Sunnyvale, or a 49 game, doesn't really matter. The simple example, you within a, a venue or an experience, you have channels to talk. The channels are contextual to the, to the venue. If you're at Stanford, anything goes. Classes take or avoid. Greek life. Right? That's a channel them into cluster conversation. Very simple. You don't want a laundry list of thousand messages and you're kind of struggling to find out. So if you care about any topic, go there. If you're applying to Stanford, go to Stanford and ask a question there. A student may hopefully reply. Or if you don't like these topics, create another topic of your own. If you're at Stanford, you'd love to play tennis. I don't know, hey, who can I ask for tennis? But your 10 friends can't, don't play tennis or they don't want to play tennis. Create a channel, 10 seconds. Leave it there. That's something, the way we are looking at the world. One more slight nuance here. This example, with what happens within this channel? Someone asks a question, people respond. As simple as that. Nothing more. It's all conversation. Of course, you can attach pictures and all of that. That's all fine. The basic thing is allow people in a context to talk locally, even if they don't know each other. Beyond friends. Now, there are a few other things. As I said, you can create your own channel. Could be a study group. Ten seconds, create four of them. Doesn't matter. Just for your high school. Just for your your because you have different groups. Invite just four people to this group. Five people to that group. All within gun high. Someone wants to create a soccer 
club in Sunnyvale. Hey, I'm a soccer coach. Every Friday night, Friday evening, I look for people to play on Saturday. Can't find people. Can't do that, right? Simple. Channels can also be public or private. So mix public, private, seamlessly, and not one to one, end to end, multiple people. Again, nothing complex there. If you like a topic, subscribe to that. If you like channels in Sunny Hill, subscribe to that. You'll be notified if anyone posts. And lastly, the notion of a concierge, which is imagine a channel that someone is serving a need. A city prep for high school. Right? Ask a question. What if someone is responding to that? Someone is providing a service to you, to the channel. So that's another nuance to keep in mind. So that's how we are building the world. So this is what computer science in play. <laughs> so this is what we are building at Logan. Now that said, let's step back to the topic again. Communities are a part of our life. We better understand how to engage to be successful, right? Because they're pervasive. It's essential absolutely to who we are, and they provide immense value. Now, if you really look at community rate right, and teams in product, how do we engage? What is a meaningful way to engage there? I'll give you something what I call the 3H axiom. And this applies to teams as well. Some of us are intellectual. We, we are, the, the, the mind, the head is very, very important. So we listen to rational arguments. One plus one equal to two. I get it. I'm going to work with you on the project. Simple. So it's a very intellectual, head-based discussion. Some of us are more driven by the heart. Yeah, you know, one plus one equal to two, but it, I don't feel it. It's not right for me. I, I, it doesn't compute. So the heart is very emotional. It's probably the most complex the topic to emotionally convince someone that something is right to do to partner with you or work with you. So understanding nuance is very, very important. Because you will work with many teams, many communities as you go in and out, right? And if your answer, if your if your proposal, if your if your dialogue is always based on one dimension, it's a guarantee that you will not convince everyone. You may never convince everyone anyway, but you may not convince the critical mass required to get your work done. So think intellectual head and think hard as well. Only then will the hands come in to help with you, to help work with you. So that's an important aspect of, of how communities build. And I say this because as I built communities in the past, business communities and now consumer communities, right? It's important to understand that orchestrating a community is not easy. Communities by definition are messy. There will be conflict. There'll be a lot of noise. So as you build communities or as you build any social business, truly understand who your core audience is, truly understand how you can engage with them, how you can nurture them for the long haul. And these rules apply to any community, whether it's personal or professional, doesn't really matter. That's something to really keep in mind. Now, everything I just told you may be all wrong. Because I am extrapolating based on my experience. I've put some thesis together. I've generalized a lot of my experiences. But it's up to you to challenge. Do not accept. And just go do it. Of course, there's some principles that apply. No question. Rational, <laughs> same concept, hopefully. But end of the day, guys, you will find things differently. You will challenge this. You will make things a little better. That's what's going to happen. But the idea is what can you take and build on? What can you leverage and make better? So in my world, as I said, going back, 
I looked at communities, I looked at social, I said, hey, now let me understand my life, what can I do better using new tools? Hence, I arrived at LOM. You would almost like to do the same, understanding how things work, finding a gap, and, and solving it in a meaningful fashion is how the process typically works. And as you build companies, as you build te engaging teams, the notion of community is going to be pervasive, whether we like it, whether we acknowledge it, or whether we understand it or not, it's going to be pervasive. Personal communities, customer communities, all of that. Even if you're in engineering, which is typically an inward-looking organization, it's going to be hugely complex. So the life cycle of building a, a product is, is not years anymore, is not months anymore. The notion of fast fail is hugely important. I'll give you a quick anecdote before I close. I used to work at Veritas, where I think uh, you were found, right? And my charter there was to expose, to build a platform around the Veritas software portfolio. The thesis was pretty simple, guys. Right? This is again in, in, in 2000, I think is that you're selling backups, software, storage solutions, very relevant, very viable, but there's no ecosystem around that. There's no community around that. How can you exchange the product so the other people can build on the platform, build on a non-existent platform? And the organization quite simply wasn't ready. So the point being, if you had an ecosystem a community around the product that you can build on and you can monetize better, the game changes dramatically. So that I think pretty much covers what I wanted to talk about. So let me now pause and take questions. Please, yeah. Was there a language barrier in the creation of Logac? And if there was, then how did you get past it? language in this question of the natural language or coding language? Natural language. Yeah, good question. So we chose to launch, uh, we are launching in English speaking markets, right? But that's a very good question. If you study social, right, products, a few markets are very, very prolific in adoption. Clearly the US, clearly Brazil, Portuguese, huge. Clearly the Latin world, very social. The chatty, of course, China, India, and, and it doesn't matter because it's English speaking anyway, so that's fine. Uh, then, of course, there is Europe, which is an amalgamation of a bunch of languages. But I would say, from where you looked at it, English clearly was the first thing because, guys, we are a small company, we can't do everything. We can do anything, but we can't do everything, right? So, English first, perhaps Brazil second, perhaps Spanish third. That's how we look at the world. So clearly, it's a choice we had to make. No, maybe perhaps like later on in the in Logac, how would you integrate? Like, how would you make? How would you deal with the Spanish speaker trying to talk to an English speaker maybe later on? Correct. We are not in the transliteration business or, or translation business. <laughs> but that said, it's an interesting point because what you're really saying is we now have a way for a Spanish-speaking person to engage with an English-speaking person or a German-speaking person, right? And guys, here's the reality. People will find a way to connect with the common language. We're going to provide a platform. We, are, we will, if you want to go talk to a guy in, in Munich, <coughs> right? You may most likely say it in English because that's what you know. And we won't change that, at least for now. Yeah. Uh, in a strictly entrepreneurial sense, or in well, any sense, how do you build a community around your company or your product with a passionate user base such that you can develop further and um, have you know, a direct response or like have a, a group of people to um, ask advice on your like, get sessions? Right. So there are two aspects of that. Let me first talk about the user community. And there's a broader ecosystem around the company, which is a separate topic. If you study communities, right, the 99-1 rule comes into play. 90% of the people are passive, lurk. They use it, but will not tell a word back. Generally, they don't. Right, that's what they do. 
9% will give you some feedback. A little bit more. 1% are going to be much more vocal in a good way because that's the core audience you want to engage. So, so math, plan for that math. If you want to get 10, you, 10 people already vocal, you will not get it if you, if you target 20 people. You just won't. Right? So that's a user perspective. And also understand that users have different stripes. Early adopters versus power users. So don't build all the widgets required to solve the power user problem. It's futile early on. That said, solve the need that a few guys have and solve it well. Right? So just keep that 99-1 rule in place and then focus on the 1% so that they can do the job better. Because they will be your vocal extenders of the brand and the product, number one. The second question, if I heard you right, the second part of the question is, as you build a company, how do you build a, a bunch of people around that stakeholders to, to kind of take a company forward, right? Of the core thing which I think Jeff talked about is a team, right? And early on, it's a product heavy team. You're building the product, right? Then as the product matures, you bring in people who are more outbound focused, right? Can be marketing perhaps. If you enterprise, then you definitely need sales as well. Enterprise, I mean selling to businesses to make money, right? So that's how the evolution will change. Having advisors is a great thing. And let me just cautiously give you an anecdote, right? Every advisor generalizes what they've had done in the past. So it's up to you to take what you think and it's relevant to you and go with what you believe. That's very important. Good. Uh, how do you plan to monetize the media? Yes, actually now our world is pretty simple. We are community as a service. Meaning, communities can be turned on, off or on. For an hour, for three days, or for three years. For a store, for a press conference, for an event, with the branding the brand wants. So that's how we're going to look at it, right? Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So for a person who is a little more old fashioned, would you say the age of hanging flyers and passing them out is gone and it's important to just, uh, or to base your community through the use of social networks and social media? See, when I was at SAP running the social media marketing business, right? The answer to that is no. I'll tell you why. Every, we have all stripes of customers. Some customers who buy tech heavy products, clearly they are much more of certain demographic, uh, psychographic, are much more online. But if you're buying, selling locomotives, or if you're selling pins, not much social there to engage on a pin. Right? So depending on the market, there will be a mix of online, even like, like 120,000 events happen every six months in the US, in example. Physical. So you're handing out flyers. Right? So that is definitely, not, is definitely evolving and changing, but the mix is also changing, but for a fact, on the ground stuff happens in marketing. No question about it. Yeah. What were some of the biggest challenges you had to face while trying to involve the different communities for the like, How did you kind of overcome them? I think that's a very interesting question. What I always said is we, can, we, don't, want to we don't want communities that are one inch deep, hundred of them. We want 10 communities that are 10 inch deep. So we are very focused on building beachhead communities. So we don't make a lot of noise. I just started speaking about Loyang the last probably month or so. We've kept quiet all this part. So pick a beachhead and make that beachhead community successful with ambassador programs in high school and colleges. We have to be interns and all of that. We are talking to stakeholders within the community. People who care about the community, who own it in some level. That's how we're looking at making each of them successful before we go to art. Okay, Mr. Ali. Thank you. Thank you.